Is it time to buy Berkshire Hathaway as we move into 2024 with a lot of uncertainty looming and the possible scenario of a recession? Today's episode, we're going to focus on Berkshire Hathaway and we're going to understand, is this company a strong buy now? Are we looking at a company that is going to continue to deliver some very strong returns over the next five to 10 years. We're going to look at their financial statements, their top line revenue growth, as well as their bottom line net income growth over the last five years. We're going to look at their balance sheet. How well is this company positioned for the future, their total cash versus their total debt? We're going to take a look at some competitors within the market sector holdings, as well as Visa and MasterCard to see is it better or just to put our money in these financial companies. We're going to take a look at what exactly compromises Berkshire Hathaway. We're going to take a look at their earnings, which they posted, as well as some important financial metrics you need to understand about this company moving forwards. And finally, you know, as always, we will put them through our stock valuation model, getting to our intrinsic value and our acceptable buy price, given that all important margin of safety. Now, for those that are new and don't understand or are unfamiliar, well, essentially Berkshire Hathaway is a holding company for a multitude of businesses, and it is run by the famous chair and CEO Warren Buffett. Now, in terms of his holdings, this heat map does show exactly how much he holds as a percentage. But if you want to take a look below as a better illustration, in terms of his holdings, well, he holds around 51% of Apple, which makes up around 178 billion worth in dollars we can see the number of shares he holds with a close second being a bank of america and in third place american express now in terms of any movements in the latest quarter well we can see he did sell around seven percent of chevron shares and buying up around 1.75 of oxy as well as selling quite a significant portion around 19 percent of his shares in hpq now we can see a lot of these shares we have reviewed individually on the channel. He also has around Coca-Cola around 7%. Now what is phenomenal and we're going to touch upon it now as we do take a look at the earnings that has come out. The cash position that Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway holds. Now straight away in terms of the earnings top line they posted a 40% jump on their operating earnings. And they hold essentially a record level cash for the company at the end of September of 157 billion. Now that is significant. And the reason why, if we take a look, if that cash position made up part of his portfolio, it would be the second largest position in Berkshire Hathaway. So something to think about there as he is sitting on a lot of cash and it will be interesting to see the moves he makes over the next few quarters. Now, in terms of this, what we can see is he has been taking advantage of the surging bond yields, buying up a significant amount of short term treasury bills, yielding at least 5%. So what exactly are we looking at? Well, we can see record level of cash, 157 billion versus the 149 high that they saw in the third quarter of 2021. And as mentioned previously, he, they are holding up a lot of short term treasury bills, yielding a minimum of 5%. Now, in terms of share buybacks, the reason right now they're not doing a lot of share buybacks as the share price has continued to increase quite rapidly over the year. But they are still buying 1.1 billion repurchasing shares, bringing their nine month total to around 7 billion. Now, when we take a very quick look, something just to highlight, they did post an investment loss. The reason for this at around 24.1 billion was for the decline that we saw in Apple from its peak at around $190. Now, in terms of the company, as we mentioned, this is the composition of the portfolio. The majority is in Apple. Let's take a look at the actual operating efficiencies and a very quick look at the historical performance. So year to date, they are up around 13.5%, lagging just slightly behind the S&P 500. And over the last 10 years, if you were to have holded BRK.B, you would be up around 203%, which is fairly decent for any return of investment. And we can see it's trading towards the mid to upper end of that 52 week range. And in terms of a PE, it is around 20.2 forward looking. Now, it doesn't currently offer a dividend yield, and you may be scratching your head wondering why not when all of these companies, in fact, the majority of these companies do pay a dividend. But instead of a dividend being paid, this is just kept on the balance sheet as cash. The reason for this, you could argue, is that instead of paying out to investors, who is better placed to run a company to do buys and sells in the market than the famous Warren Buffett? But again, that is subjective to different investors and their thoughts. In terms of how the company has performed, well, income statement, let's take a look. 
And as always, 3 to 7% is what we like to aim for as a minimum on the revenue growth. 245, well, 248 billion reported in 2018, 302 reported in 2022, with the trailing 12 months looking at 332. So we should expect another nice increase from 22 to 23. And when we get that annual report, we will dissect that here on the channel. So on a more granular level, how does it look? Well, 2018, it has gone up to 2019 before having that small drop, which you could argue due to COVID is reasonable. And then it has rebounded quite nicely. And again, in 2022. So you are looking at a strong set of financial statements so far in terms of the revenue growth. And if we take a quick look at the bottom line, the net income, well, what we can see, 4 billion reported in 2018. And then we see here a negative of 22.8 billion in December 2022. Now, the reason that we see such a negative figure on the bottom line is when we take a look in more detail, we can see from the 2022 annual reports, they reported a net loss of 22.8 billion. The reason for this driven by a nearly 54 billion decline in the value of its stock portfolio. Now, the way this works, essentially, these are unrealized losses on their investments. But with accounting rules, they do need to declare this. So even though they didn't sell those investments, whether or not the share price goes up or down, those unrealized gains or losses do need to be declared. And we can see here when you do exclude those losses on their stock investments, which were unrealized, they actually recorded for the year 30.8 billion operating earnings, which was higher than 12% the year before. So that is something you do need to bear in mind when analyzing Berkshire Hathaway, that if share prices of their company goes up or down, they do need to rec realize or they're still unrealized, but they do need to record those gains or losses on their investments. So there's something just to bear in mind. Now, when we take a look at the health of the company's balance sheet, total cash versus total debt, December 2018, they had around 112 billion sitting in cash and short term investments. Latest quarterly report, as we just ran through, 147 billion. So that's a significant amount. And as we mentioned, a lot of those are in yields or bonds of over 5% short term treasury bonds. So that is a significant amount and it has increased over the period. Now, when we take a look at that all important total debt numerically and directionally, we can see it has also increased from around 97.5 billion to around 125 billion. So something just to bear in mind, but also do realize their total debt at 125 billion is still lower than their total cash. So if they wanted to, they could pay that off within a day. Now, if we move on to just comparing them now, these aren't really what I would call their competitors or any of their peers, but we can still do a very quick look. These are companies here, these two Compass and K9 that are multi-sector holding financial companies. And just so that we can have a look for a company like Visa or Mastercard, how Berkshire Hathaway has performed on a total return basis. So year to date, they are up 13.52%. Now, they are in the middle of those what I, you could call competitors that we're looking at. And if we take a look at the five year, it's always better the longer you can look out in terms of the data to get a more accurate reflection of the past. We can see that Berkshire is up around 63%. Again, lagging behind a few of those that we are comparing them to. If you do take a look at the same Visa or MasterCard, they have outperformed Berkshire Hathaway. Do remember, though, we are not looking at past performance as an indicator of the future. It is just one good additional layer of review that we do. And for those that have want to have a look, this is the Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio. So do if you want to take a pause and want to have a look, I'm more than welcome to. And I can always put the link in the bottom just so that that is available to you there. Now, let's take a look exactly at the company's financial metrics and what we can see the market cap sitting around 767 billion, making it a mega cap company. Now, they don't pay any dividends, so we aren't looking or focusing on any payout ratios. So in terms of the free cash flow per share, again, earnings per share, as usual, it is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting. So we do focus on that all important free cash flow. $10 in 2013, $15 in 2022. So it has increased by around 50% over the last 10 years. Slight inconsistencies, some years where it's fairly flat before dropping and then increasing quite considerably and then falling again. But overall, in terms of the long term projections and trajectory, it is moving in the right direction. Sales growth. Now, what we can see, as I said, three to seven percent year on year. This isn't going to be a fast growing company or group of companies. And what we can see, the growth isn't double digits every single year. It is barely between the three to seven percent. So I would say on average, it is decent overall, but it isn't a fast growing company. So do just bear that in mind if you are thinking of Berkshire as a company that continues to grow double digits year on year. In terms of numerically speaking, well, 178 billion in 2013. 
302 billion in 2022. So again, it is nice, it is increasing, but we can see it is fairly slow, steady increases year on year. And shares outstanding, whilst they do share buybacks, it is at a slower rate than maybe what you would expect given on how much cash they are sitting on. ROIC, well, what we can see, 10% minimum is what we do say year on year. It does mean management are able to effectively allocate their capital. Now, 2022, as we mentioned earlier, due to those unrealized gains or losses, well, losses, in fact, in this case, that they had to report, that ROIC figure is negative. But the few years before that, we do see it above 10%, but then the period before that, slightly lower. So fairly inconsistent on the ROIC. Free cash flow margins, operating margins, Operating margin around 12% or more is what we like to see. So they are consistently able to get higher than that over the long period. But bear in mind that 2022, again, is what you could call a one-off event. A free cash flow margin above that 12% that we look for. In fact, 7% is what we look for on the free cash flow margin. So it is consistently above that. So that is positive, although it isn't as high as maybe you thought. But then again, do let me know your thoughts in the comments below as we are going through. Did you think that the metrics of BRKB would be a lot higher? Net debt to EBITDA, as I mentioned, this shows the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. They have a far superior cash balance, which is ever increasing than their total debt. So that isn't a real worry. Now moving on to the stock valuation model. And as always, if you do enjoy the content value is being provided, do hit that like button, do subscribe to the bell to be continually notified of these videos. And as always, if you want to grab a copy of the valuation model to get your own intrinsic value or acceptable buy price, then do click on the pinned comment below. Now, Jumping into Graham's valuation formula, we have the stock ticker, the earnings per share, growth rate per analyst estimates, and that current yield on AAA corporate bonds. Remember, based on the formula, the higher the current yield goes, the lower the intrinsic value will be. So we have the intrinsic value sitting at $491. Now, do bear in mind their earnings per share did jump quite a lot from last year, so you may see this is slightly skewed, but let's run with it for the moment, $491. And what we can see at the current price, that is above the 52-week high and showing signs of some undervaluation or strong undervaluation with nice upside in the current market. Now, typically, the multiples valuation model would be the second model we use. However, given the models and what we have been through in terms of comparing them, there aren't that many companies, in my opinion, that you could compare BRK to. And therefore, I would say we should leave this model out for our analysis. Third one as well, very easy. We're not using this one. They don't pay a dividend. But let me know your thoughts below if you do believe this is a company that should start to pay dividends. We then move on to the DCF model with our free cash flows year on year. The average growth rate at 6.51. Forward-looking analysts estimating around 12%. Given our discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flow and terminal value. Add together the cash, subtract total debt, arrive at the equity value. Divide by the shares outstanding to give a DCF price of $381. Now, as always, the intrinsic value is just the average of the models that we run through. And in this episode, BRK is coming to $436. Now, with the current price sitting at 351, we start off with a margin of safety of 10%. If you believe as a whole, it has a wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward looking data. And that would be an acceptable buy of around $392. Now, those looking for a larger margin of safety at 15%, it would still be a buy at 370. And at 20%, a buy at 348, roughly not far off the current trading price. So you could argue it is a buy at around $349, $350 with a 20% margin of safety. Now, for those looking at a larger margin of safety at 25%, you would say a buy up to 327 based on the estimates we've run through. And those looking at a far superior margin of safety at around $305. When we take a look, that is still within that 52-week range. Now, what do Wall Street say? Well, they believe the share price to have some nice upside even to the current trading price at $414, which as we can see is even higher than the 52-week high. So they believe that it will smash through those 52-week highs over the next 12 months. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Is this a company you are looking to buy? Is it one you already have and just add every single month? Or are you looking to sell this? Or even if you're just on the sidelines, let me know why this isn't a company you would be looking to add to your own portfolio and your thoughts on whether or not they should be paying dividends. As always, do hit that like, do subscribe and hit the bell if you want to be continually notified of these videos as they drop, which they do on a regular basis. If you want to grab a copy of the valuation model to get to the intrinsic value of companies in your own portfolio to get to your own acceptable buy price, do click on that pinned comment below. As always, do come and join us in the Patreon by clicking on that Patreon link below, joining us in the Discord, talking all things buyers and sells in the market, as well as anything stock market and finance related. As always, have a great day. Catch you on the next episode. Do like and subscribe. Take care and goodbye.